So, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Philip. I'll walk you for the next 50 or so minutes through a couple of Elasticsearch things. And um, just to get a quick idea, who is already using Elasticsearch? Who has no idea what Elasticsearch is? OK, very few. Um, I would have a ton of slides, but I don't want to show you a million slides. Um, we will draw all of this out on the whiteboard. Um, so we'll do it more interactively. If you have any questions, just shout and ask. Um, for good questions or answers, I also have these um, bouncy balls that are supposed to blink, and I'll throw these at you. Um, so don't fall asleep, otherwise a bouncy ball might hit you at some point. Um, that's the other thing we can do with those. So, um, and like I said, we, we would have a ton of slides, but we'll, we'll not do slides. I've, I've done too many slides recently, and we'll, we'll do this differently. So for those of you who have never heard of Elasticsearch, um, I have just stumbled today across something that was um, aggregating GitHub stats. And the nice thing is, in terms of various metrics like stars, pull requests, loads, um, pull request creators, and um, also issues, though I'm not sure if issues is a great metric. Um, Elasticsearch is one of the most popular data stores, or the most popular data store on, on GitHub as of today. And we've had the most issues for a long time. I'm not sure this is a bug or a feature, um, but that is a different thing. So when you use Elasticsearch, and I have started a cluster already, um, we have the current version running here, um, which tells me it's 8.2.2, which is fine. Um, and that one, what you normally would do is um, you would then add a document. So you could just say um, post, um, let's say it's a test document and I, and I want to add a document. And then I say, I don't know, my name is Philip. And then it will do something and it will tell me that it this was successful and it was written successfully twice and we'll figure out why twice. and version one, and we'll get back to all of these. Um, but this looks very simple, right? And kind of like we'll now open the hood and see what is happening behind the scenes in all of this. Um, starting with um, what is a cluster. And by the way, if you've ever seen the Elastic logo, um, looks like this. There are a couple of stickers next to the feedback box. Take the stickers afterwards so I don't have to carry them home. But the Elastic logo looks like this. Um, this is not a flower, as some people think. Um, this is a cluster. And you can see these little colored pieces here. These are the so-called charts. We'll get to the charts later on, but this is very related to what Elasticsearch does and where it's coming from. And this is why the logo looks like this. So the basic thing is um, we, we wrote this document and it came into my cluster and then my cluster did something and it was just working. And the simplest way to run a cluster in Elasticsearch is um, you could run the binary, on Windows, Linux as a Docker image, and various other ways. Um, and what you would have is um, you have a node, and I'll just say this is my node, and your write operation comes in here, and then it sends out the response afterwards. Um, it also sends back out of the cluster. Now, this is the very simple cluster that you could have. Um, obviously, you want to have more than a single node because A, you might want to scale, and B, you want to have some high availability. So if that node um, goes down, we wouldn't succeed in that. So we will need to add a second node. Um, for those who have used Elasticsearch in the past, can I have a cluster with two nodes in Elasticsearch? Yes, I, so yeah, so there, there, so there is a very big caveat. Um, and I'll, I say, I'll give you a, a bouncy ball for that. Um, so yes, you can do that. Um, but this is a very b bad idea. And you should not do this. Um, why? Because Elasticsearch is based on a quorum concept. So there is something called the cluster state. And the cluster state is basically how is the cluster organized. It's not the, the data itself, but it's the metadata of your cluster. And that keeps track of which indices and charts will get to those concepts, but which things of information do you have? What nodes do you have there? What are the, the mappings or so-called schemas um, in your cluster? So all of this need to be stored in the cluster. And the problem is, this is a quorum system, because maybe you've heard of the CAP theorem, consistency, availability, partition tolerance, and you can have at most two of those three. Um, so the problem is, if you have only two nodes and the network between those two nodes breaks, um, which node is still alive or the right one? Because you could either write them to this one or to that one, and they wouldn't know if the other one is there. 
And the so-called cluster state can only be managed by one so-called master node, as already mentioned. So there are multiple master eligible nodes, and they vote the current master. And you need a quorum for that. And a quorum is made out of normally an odd number, because you need to have that election. So normally, you will, would have a third node. Um, and these three, then, if the network between those here breaks, then this node would know, I don't see the other two. I'm isolated. I cannot be keeping track of the current cluster state. Um, I can't do anything. Whereas these two, as long as they see each other, they know we're in the majority. So whatever happens, we are keeping that cluster alive. And then those two, for example, um, would um, make the, let's say this is a little crown. Um, this one would be the current uh, master node of that cluster. So the, the minimum you need to have in any highly available cluster is three nodes. Um, otherwise, either you are not highly available because you have a single node, or you could have two nodes. Um, but then only one could be master eligible, because that would then decide and keep track of the cluster state. Because with two, there is no, no quorum, and you couldn't keep track of them. Yes? Your cluster is dead. Um, so. <laughs> Yes, so if you don't have a majority anymore in your cluster, um, then the cluster will just stop. So if you, if you have a very volatile environment and you say, like, maybe I, no, I lose two of those master eligible uh, nodes at once, how many master eligible nodes would you need? Five, because you still need that majority of three. So you could then lose two. So anybody who has an even number of master eligible nodes um, is probably not doing their, themselves a favor, because if I have four master eligible nodes, what is the majority of four? Three, so I can still only lose one single node. So you're not doing yourself any favor. Um, so that's um, um, that that that's not any good. So this is the cluster, and so far I have talked only about the so-called master eligible nodes or master node. There can only be one master node at once. We had bugs in the past if that there are multiple master nodes. Um, that will mean a very bad day for your cluster. Um, there was one concept we've had for a long time, which was called uh, minimum master nodes, where you had to set what is the minimum. So if you had three master eligible nodes, you would need to set that to two so that your cluster knows what is the majority. We have removed that concept by now. Um, we now have a bootstrapping concept where the, the nodes find each other. And once they have formed a stable cluster, the cluster itself will keep track of how many master eligible nodes you have. Um, and what is the majority of that? So you cannot miscalculate. And you also don't have problems if you scale your master eligible nodes up or down. Your cluster will keep track of that. Because that was, in older versions, one of the, or probably the number one reason why you screwed up your cluster was that the minimum master nodes were not configured correctly. And then they would basically break into two separate clusters. And there was no way to reconcile that. So by now, you only basically, in the configuration, when you bootstrap a cluster, you would only need to tell the nodes like, hey, there are these other nodes. And you would say, like, this is master eligible, or these three are master eligible. And they will then figure out, OK, we have formed a majority. We form, a, or we elect or vote for a master node. Um, we form a stable cluster, and then they just work. And whatever you change in the cluster, as long as you don't remove more than half of the master eligible nodes at once, your cluster will just keep working. and doing everything for you. But this was a big pain point in the past that we got rid of. Um, so far, our cluster hasn't done anything useful because I was just talking about metadata, right? We actually normally care about the actual data. So besides being master eligible, there are various other roles a cluster can have. So that the default role that we would have is a so-called data node. That's one that stores data. There are other roles like ingest, which is doing an ingest processing. So if you have log lines and you need to break them apart with regular expressions, um, an ingest node could do that. Who likes writing regular expressions? OK, that's the Stockholm syndrome, right? Um, there are better ways than that, but that's a different discussion. Anyway, so you have, um, you have your data nodes. Um, there are other node types um, that we could have as well. So there are client-only nodes, which are like a, like a smart proxy or load balance in the cluster, which might not be that useful or needed anymore. We also have some machine learning components. So by default, your nodes have all of these roles 
but if you have a very large cluster, you would break them out into different roles. So for example, that ingest node that runs your regular expressions would mostly need CPU to do all the parsing, but it wouldn't need so much memory and disk. Whereas your data nodes, which store all the data, would have a different hardware profile. So once you have a larger cluster, you would have different roles and you would break them out to use better hardware profiles to make it more cost efficient and performant. Um, but that is only for a, from a certain size on, I would say. Like if you have uh, nine or more nodes or so, you could start thinking about breaking out the different roles, but you will always need at least two for high available availability of each role type, except for the master eligible nodes where you always need three for the majority. Um, and then you could structure your clusters. Also for stability, we often recommend for larger clusters like nine plus or so to have so-called dedicated master nodes, um, which only have the role of that master because if the nodes with that cluster state are running some queries and run out of memory and die, your cluster again will have a very bad day because no master nodes, um, pretty much everything stops and breaks. So from a certain size on, you probably want to break those out in a, into a specific or into a dedicated node to avoid those problems and have higher cluster stability. Um, so just to give you an idea, what I have running here is um, I use the so-called cat API, which gives us in human readable form, um, shows us what is going on in the cluster. And I'm interested in the nodes here um, and actually just shows you a, a lot of almost random numbers and things. Um, and I'll just add the so-called, oops, lowercase, this should be lowercase, um, V parameter, and that then adds the headers, and then you can see what is going on in here. So you can see I have an, a cluster with three nodes. Um, this is the IP, this is the, the heap, and RAM uh, used the CPU I have assigned to those, the, the load. Then we have various rows. I'll get into those into a moment in a moment. All three here are master eligible because only three nodes, so we need a majority. And this one with that little star, this is the currently elected master. And then you have, um, well, the names. And you can see my cluster is basically using two and a half nodes because it's using two full nodes and then a so-called tiebreaker. This tiebreaker is only there really to, to decide in the vote, um, to, to guarantee that majority, but here I, like you said before, I almost have a two node cluster, but not quite. We have the tiebreaker to, to keep the high availability. And then these are um, the, the node roles and attributes that my node has. So this is a master eligible nodes, but V means voting only, so this can only vote. Um, and then these, these have a lot of other um, roles. So for example, I stands for ingest, H is hot data. We'll get to hot data a bit later. Um, master eligible, um, and a couple of other roles. Um, these are very hard to remember and you always need to look them up in the documentation or at least I need to do that. Uh, but these, these are the, the node attributes that we have set on this cluster here. So this is the, the cluster and the, the node type so far. Um, we've talked about discovery. Basically, you need to tell this node um, there is this other node. And if this node knows this one, it would tell it. So you don't need to tell this node all the other nodes in the cluster. But as long as a node knows at least one other node in the cluster, it would share the, the topology of your cluster. Um, and I think that's more or less it for the cluster and the cluster coordination. So far, so good? Good. Um, the next thing that we have, I wrote my one document, and then we have this, these concepts called index and chart in Elasticsearch. Um, so, um, if I write that document from before again, um, it would tell me something about shards here and the total count of two and successful two. Um, what happened here behind the scenes? So when you do a write operation, um, wherever I put my black pen. Um, so basically the write operation comes in and I say I write to the index and the index that I'm writing to would say like it's called database. And this index then consists, or the index is basically a collection of similar or related documents. And this index can then be broken up into so-called shards. Um, so under this, basically we have shards. The default by now is that one index has exactly one shard. If you were using an older version, does anybody remember how many primary shards we had back then? Five, yes. Whoever was first. Um, and that is 
the unit of scaling. So one shard always lives on one of these nodes. Um, so if I have only one, all the data for this index would be written, let's say, on this node. Um, so the, the shard is how to, to break that up. Initially, we had five primary shards because it was very cool to show that how the data is split up over multiple nodes and how it can automatically scale up and down. So if I add more nodes to my cluster or if I remove nodes, the shards will automatically be moved as needed in the cluster. Um, one is kind of like a dumb number to show that, right? Why did we change that? Because most people had the problem that they had way too many shards, so there was some kind of, or there is a bit of an overhead to each shard. Um, also, because distributing data, if you don't need it, can be a bit costly. Um, that's why we switched the, the default to one shard. Um, if you have a lot of data, um, you will need more shards. Does anybody have any idea how large a shard should approximately be? Yes, please. Yes, so it, so, Okay, I'll hit five people now, because <laughs> this is packaged and it's a bit hard to throw, but please forward if it doesn't reach you. Okay. Um, so, the, the size of shards, so the favorite saying at Elastic that we have is it depends, um, because it might depend on your hardware and your use case. So a full text search use case might be a bit smaller, have the optimal size. Um, larger, like logs use cases generally have that 50 gig limit. Um, we have also seen people push it a bit further because we have done some optimizations that some things in the heap are smaller. But 50 gigabytes is definitely a very good default number if you aim for that. That's also, if you have a logs use case, what we would configure by default for shards to fill up before we start a new one. Um, so we have that chart. Now, I've mentioned the high availability with the, with the master eligible nodes. Um, what you actually have is a so-called primary shard and the replica shard. So this primary or this shard is broken up in one primary. Sorry. Um, and there is exactly one. And then optional, you have um, zero to n replica shards. And the primary shard is basically, let's say, um, we, we write our little document comes in here and we write our document here. And then it gets replicated. Let's say we keep the default replication factor of one. So we create one second copy. So in total, we have two copies of the data. Um, and that replica will be then be written here on that node. Um, so if this node goes down, the data is still here. Everything keeps working. Um, if you do any read or search operation, you could go either to this node or to that node because both have the same data and, and would um, fulfill your search request. Um, if this node goes down, you can still go to this node. Um, would my cluster try to fix that there is only one copy now? Yes, uh, after a one minute timeout by default. Um, it would then start re-replicating that data to this other node so that you have two copies again. Um, so it would do that automatically for you. If I have a single node cluster, which is not highly available, and I configure one primary shard, that, which I always need to have, and one replica shard, would I have one or two copies of that data on my single node? Yes? Yes, why? Exactly, yes. It doesn't make much sense. I, the only thing, if I, so this is not possible, but if I wrote my second copy here, the replica on the same node, I wouldn't gain anything. I just double the disk space, but it's, I'm not getting more um, availability because if the node goes down, both copies go down or disappear. Also, I would just double the, the disk space used on this one. So I, I'm not gaining anything from that. So replicas can only be on one other node. You can, by the way, configure replicas, not just as a fixed number, but you could even say like, 0 to n, because the, the cluster, if you have a single node cluster and you configure or keep the default of one replica shard, your cluster would always say, like, you told me to keep a second copy of this data, but I can only keep one single copy because there's only one node. And that would affect the, the cluster state or the health of your cluster. But you could also say that in how many copies you want to have, you could say 0 to 1. So your cluster would automatically know there's a single node, I'll keep a single copy. There are two or more nodes, I will keep Two, two copies of the data. So you can keep that configurable. Um, so that is the, 
What's your question? No? Good. Um, so uh, that was, yeah? Yes. Um, should we do that right now? I mean, we can. I, I wanted to do it a little later, but um, we can do the anatomy of like a, a, an operation right away. So let me, let me start over. Let's say we have a very simple use case where we have three nodes. Um, so we have node one, two, three. Um, we say this one here is the master, even though it doesn't really matter. Um, and let's say we have, the, we have a put or a post have that coming into that node. Um, every document um, has a so-called ID. Um, you can see that here in that underscore ID field, that is the ID. It's by default randomly generated if you do a post. Um, otherwise, you could do a put. Copy that so I don't have to type all of this. And this is, by the way, all curl commands, basically. Um, so read this as curl x post. Um, this is the endpoint, and then this is the JSON document. So this is a REST API. Elasticsearch exposes it on port 9200 by default. Um, this is just in Kibana. We have this slightly more compact syntax to write it, uh, but it's uh, absolutely the same. So here you could say put document. You provide the ID manually, and then you would write the same document, and it has the ID um, one. If you don't provide the ID, um, so this is put or post. With post. Um, this node here would automatically generate the ID for you. Um, so you have then, um, you have underscore ID, and you have whatever ID you have. So in the put, you provide that. In the post, it, um, it generates the ID for you. What you do then is um, you hash the shard, uh, sorry, you hash the ID. You calculate it modulo number the primary shards. And that tells you where it should go. So what you do is um, you have the, you do a hash function, oops, hash of underscore ID, and then you calculate it modulo the number of primary shards. Um, so for example, in that case, if you only have one primary shard, it's a bit boring. Uh, but if you have five, let's say we have five primary shards, then it would calculate um, modulo five. And, and that would give you then, let's say, node three or shard three. Um, and it would then look into that, in that cluster state. Shard three of this index is located on which node? So um, why do I hash this? Why don't I just take the ID modulo five? Yes, exactly, because otherwise I might get a hotspot. So for example, if I have the IDs and I use the, the name, for example, um, oops, sorry, um, for, and, and then you don't have that key space evenly distributed, you would get a hotspot on one node. So that's why you use a hashing function and to evenly distribute the data. By the way, in the very early versions of Elasticsearch, we used a bad hashing function, and that very unevenly distributed the data. If you used 33 primary shards, that was a bug or a limitation in the, in the hashing function. But of course, somebody figured that out, because then some shards would get zero documents and others had tons. Um, and so the initial uh, hashing function we had, djb2 from DJ Bernstein, who is a big in cryptographer. Um, and now we are using murmur3, which is also a widely used hash function. In the end, you want something that is evenly distributed and pretty fast to calculate. So we've hashed the ID. We calculated modulo the number of primary shards, and it says shard 3 is where this document goes. And let's say we have my cluster has allocated shard three on this node here. So what it then does is um, it then, let's say this is then, so this here, the first node you're hitting is the so-called coordinating node because it coordinates that right. Um, it can be any node. Um, normally, we would round robin between all the nodes. So also that load is um, evenly distributed in your cluster. Um, it then says, um, go to, Go to shard three because let's say this is this node has shard three, and then you you write that document here as the primary shard, and then it also says the replica shard of three is on let's say this node. So then it would um, replicate the document to here. 
And what then happens once you have written this, this node, so this, this the, the node that writes does some basic checking if this operation can actually be fulfilled, otherwise it would recheck the write right away. If it can do that, it will replicate the data. Um, so um, maybe I should number these a bit better. So you have, this is the first step, this is the second step, this is the third step. And then you have um, here, you get an act back, that is the fourth step. Um, and then you get, I'm got getting lost in my colors. Um, you get an egg back here in step five, and then in step six at the end, um, this is when your client, whatever, like programming language, curl, whatever, um, gets the acknowledgement back from your write operation. So it basically works its way through the entire cluster just because it's distributed like that in this example. It could be any, on any node. Um, but this is how a write operation works. Good? Cool. Yes, please. Yes, I mean, the, the thing is the same, um, just th this part here is different. Yes, you only have one primary shard. So it, but I mean, the, the write operation looks the same. But the thing is, if you have five, um, you, I could have like primary shards, like let's say two primary shards here, two primary shards here, one primary shard here. So that the data of that index could be distributed amongst the nodes and the load as well to write them. So if, with the five, let's say I have blue is the, the number of primary shards. So I have two primary shards here, two primary shards here, and one primary shard here. And then the replicas would be, of course, like always not on the same node, but then let's say we have three replicas here, because it doesn't matter. We have uh, one replica here and one replica here. So they would just, if you have five primary shards and five replica shards, they could just be more evenly distributed. Whereas if you have three nodes and only one primary and one replica shard, all the data would only go to two nodes. Um, because normally you have a lot of indices to write, and there is an overhead, and most people have way too little data for multiple shards. Um, so the, we have seen clusters which had, I don't know, thousands of shards, and that ba basically kept the cluster busy, just keeping track of the shards and everything, which was a very common occurrence. Um, a, we have changed a bit the tooling and the defaults behind it, so we have few of that. B, we have a project that we call many shards. So by now, you can actually have thousands of shards per cluster. Previously, we had like a, a rough calculation per gigabyte of heap. You should only have 20 shards approximately. But that calculation is very outdated by now, so you can, you can have a lot more. But because of these things, um, we went down to one, because normally you have multiple indices, or if you have logs, um, you, you write them for some specific time frame, and then you roll over to the next index. So you, you will have a lot of shards in your system going on normally anyway. But if you have a specific use case and you only have one index, set the number of shards correctly. Um, OK, so that was the anatomy of a write. So far, yeah. Yes, please. So that the number of shards is picked up front, but there are two APIs that you can um, use now. They are called uh, split and shrink. Um, so these are basically you. What you would need to do is you have index, let's say one primary shard foo, and the API call would be foo um, slash underscore split slash um, the target index. So you would need to rename it, but you can change it, uh, the number of primary shards with that operation. And that is actually very fast because it's just doing some sim linking on the, on the disk um, to either split it. So it keeps like some virtual splitting in the background running. Um, or it could combine them, so you can do that at any point in time. You need to change the name of the index, but with aliases you could fix that afterwards again. Uh, but you can split and shrink at any point since six point something, I think. So, a couple of years. Um, it was a big limitation a long time ago, but not anymore. Yes, please. Yes. I mean, the, I think 
I think the so the the primary shard, if I remember correctly, will start the replication on all nodes, but it will wait for the majority of replicas to respond because then it's sure that it's correctly written and then it will acknowledge it. So it will not necessarily wait for all of them, but the majority, because there is always this failure scenario if like n nodes die, um, what are your replicas worth? So you always need to have the majority acknowledge that all of them have the same data, otherwise you might be in trouble. And actually that is, it sounds like an uncommon scenario, but I know a big German shopping retailer, whatever, and they have something like 30 or more replicas. Because search operations can go to any copy primary or replica, and they just want to parallelize their search so much, and uh, for them latency is very important because otherwise people abandon the search. Um, so they, they have, I think, one shard or maybe two shards or so, um, but then a ton of copies just to keep that um, quick. Which is, by the way, a good point. Um, how do you scale your writes? You have more shards, so you can parallelize the writing. How do you scale your reads? You have more replicas because then you have more copies from where you can answer. Um, hope that makes sense. Um, um, so that was a search. Um, sh uh, sorry, that was a write. Yes, please. On the per yes, if you don't provide it, it is get being generated on the first node. Yes. Yeah, it's something, I think, the number of stars and whatever, it's like, it's it's pretty much impossible. Um, um, uh, so, I don't, I, I forgot the actual details of how unlikely it was, um, but there was a calculation, if for a hundred years you write a million operations a second, um, then you have a 50% chance or something like that. Um, and that is way more data than you normally have in an index. Um, so, uh, that should not be a practical concern. Yes, please. But I mean, so if you provide the ID, yes, um, yes, yes. Also because, so what this operation actually does is, if you do a put, the put when you provide the ID could actually overwrite an existing document. So you always need to read first and check if I'm replacing or writing a new. Um, if you do a post, it basically has an operation attached um, that it says create and it wouldn't overwrite anything. Um, but any such collisions are more theoretical. I don't think that is anything that would hit you in practice. Um, everybody good? Um, then should we do a search? Because so far we have, um, only um, written. So we have we have three nodes again, and we do a search. Um, what is the right HTTP verb for a search? Get um, or post? Yes. Um, why is that? So yes, we use get or post. Why is that? Yes, because our searches are. I mean, I. Yeah, so a search operation could look uh, like I, I would use the index and then I would say search, this is the endpoint. Um, oops. Ah. And then I would need to say, um, I, I, I want to do a query. Um, and then in a query, I don't know, I want to do a match. And then I say, I have a name. And then the name is Philip. And then my two documents or three documents that I've written so far will come back. Um, now, get cannot have a body. Um, I can do the same with the post. Yeah, it shouldn't, it's not in the spec. Um, and using post for a, write or for a read operation is also weird, so there is no winning here. And we kind of don't care and we're pragmatic, so it's, it's up to you. The post, generally people frown upon because it's the wrong HTTP verb. Uh, the bigger problem is normally the get, because sometimes when people run some reverse proxies, they discard the body silently or some, some querying tools because they don't expect the body there. And then you just run this because it discards the body. And the tricky thing is this gets, gives you 10 random documents from the, the thing. So it looks like all your searches are broken. Um, so generally, um, I, I tend to use get, but post is kind of safer because you won't run into any such issues. 
Um, so um, our search, get or post, is coming in. And I'll just say we, we're hitting the search endpoint. And it's coming in here. And this is, again, the coordinating node. And I have, we said, I don't know, the colors are, doesn't, don't matter. But let's say we have the primary shot here. And we have the replica shot here. And actually, let's say we have an index with two shards to make it a bit more interesting. And we have the, the replica 0 here and the replica 1 shot here. And then we have, obviously, the primary shot 0 here and the replica shot 1 is here. This is a bit of a constructed uh, problem, of course, but it doesn't really matter. So your search query comes in, and you're searching for all the users that are called Philip. Um, and we can search either um, primary or replica, so it doesn't matter. Um, but actually, this is a, a so-called two-step approach how the search operation works. Um, we call it um, um, scatter gather. Oops, scatter gather. This is what we call it. Um, so because if I'm doing this search operation, um, and full text search is not just about exact matches, but more this like concept of what I might search. So there is always the, the so-called score here. How well? Is this document fitting my search query? So it's like the relevancy rating that you have in a search engine as well. Um, and let's assume we have millions of documents and we have like a search query that might hit 100 documents. By default, the search only gives you 10 documents back. You can change that, of course, with the size parameter, but it only gives you 10 documents back. It would, however, be very wasteful for this coordinating node to say um, to each node, like, give me all the results and then just send all of them back, because the search operation is only by default getting us the top 10 results. So what it does is it goes, the coordinating node goes to each shard, and it doesn't matter if primary or replica, but it goes to 0 and 1 and says, like, please give me your top 10 results for this search. And it only gets back the document ID and the score. And then the coordinating node will get how many sub-results back? 20, so 10 from each primary shot, because 10 is the total number it wants to get back. And then it sorts them and figures out, overall, these are the 10 top documents. And then it fetches by ID. Um, it fetches the actual documents in the second round from these. So basically, um, what, what you have is um, you have the scatter phase. Um, it goes to the nodes and says, like, give me back the documents. And you will get back um, the I ID of the document and the score. Um, and then it will get another in the second round. So this is basically phase 0. And then there is um, the phase 1. Um, this is a, a get by ID. So it's then getting the documents, putting together the final result, and then you're getting the documents back. Obviously, if you have 100 charts, this is also more expensive, because then you need to get 10 sub-results from 100 shards, combine them, figure, figure out the top 10, and then fetch those. If you have a single shard, this is a lot simpler. Um, so this is another reason why you don't want to go too crazy. Um, OK, so that was uh, get. So far, so good. Timing-wise, we still have 20 minutes. Um, I probably have material for three more hours, but we'll, we'll figure out what makes most sense. No questions so far? Yep, please. Yes, the shard, I mean, de decreased, you would need to do a split. Um, and, and then it will decrease. Um, but otherwise, it will just keep increasing, which is a good point. Um, because under the hood of all of this, when you write data, there is Apache Lucene is the library writing actually to disk. Because sometimes people are asking, like, what is actually writing and doing all of that? Um, so that's Apache Lucene. And the, the clever trick or the combination of Elasticsearch and Lucene is um, Lucene is really a library for Java developers. And Elasticsearch is kind of the wrapper around it. It provides the REST API, the query DSL, it does the distribution, replication, balancing of the cluster, and everything. But for Lucene, it looks like, and that is unfortunately a bit unfortunate, what we call an Elasticsearch index is made up of multiple shards. And each shard is a so-called Lucene index. So it's kind of index here, index there. Um, but Lucene thinks that it's Lucene index, the shard, is the whole world. Whereas Elasticsearch knows there are multiple ones. I'll get the results from all of them and combine them. But that's kind of like how the two are related. Um, and 
Lucene is writing the data, and that's the, the so-called chart size. Actually, how Lucene works, and this is maybe a good addition to the, the writing from before, or I don't really have enough space here, um, and I, I'll stay on the top so everybody can see that. So when you have a, a write, and it doesn't matter if it's a post or a put coming in, into Elasticsearch, what happens? So there is a so-called, um, we have a buffer. This is where the document gets kind of like put at first, um, and then the acknowledgement and whatever works. So this is within one node now. So this is the buffer um, that happens in Lucene. Um, and then this buffer is being taken and written out into a so-called segment. This is the Lucene concept, um, and segments are immutable. By default, they are written once every second. Maybe you have seen refresh once a second um, is the default. Um, so all the documents that accumulate within one second are buffered and then written out into a segment. For durability of your data, there is another concept um, coming from that buffer, um, and that is the so-called trends log, the transaction log. Um, which is immediately written to disk and is just sequentially written, so it's very cheap to write. Um, whereas this does more and does some analysis, so there, there is some more overhead here. These are also at first only um, written in memory, and only once that data is f-synced to disk, the trends log with all the other write operations um, is, can be removed. So basically, a write operation comes in here, it's put, or let's say, it's then immediately um, put into the trends log. Um, another write operation comes in here. Um, it's again immediately put in trends log. The one second timeout is kind of over. We create a new segment. So we create a segment with those, these two write operations. These just exist in memory. Potentially, you get multiple of these. Once these are flushed to disk, um, then only these are taken out. And that's how the transaction log works. But most data stores like Postgres, MySQL, whatever, um, they have something called, or, or I think Postgres calls it the transaction log, MySQL a bin log, but it's kind of like the same concept that you have this thing that writes all the data for durability immediately. Um, and that is how a write works. The thing is, the segments are immutable. And I'm coming back to your question now. Um, so that this is immutable. Every time you update a document, it's basically marked for deletion in the segment and written anew. This is a bit unfortunate because this makes small updates very expensive in Elasticsearch. So if you have a very large document with 100 fields and you update a single document, you still need to rewrite the entire document every time you update that. There are some ways around to structure that and do that, but that's the, the basic law because of Lucene, because of the immutability, which has some other nice attributes, uh, but that is one of the downsides. Um, so these se small segments, once every second by default, are being written. After some time, you have hundreds or thousands of those, and then there is a so-called merge happening, where you combine multiple of these writes. Also, all the documents that have been replaced or deleted are then removed, and only like the current documents are being written into the larger segment. So multiple small segments over time are aggregated into larger segments over time. Um, so the disk space might sometimes be fluctuating or a bit higher than what you would expect based on those merges. And the merges just happen in the background. Um, that was this. Um, there's one other thing that I, have, um, that I have kind of glanced over. Let's write another document. Um, so we have seen um, the shards. It's now clear why we have written two shards in total, one primary, one replica. Um, we also have the ID, we've talked about that, we see the index, and then we have this version field. Does anybody know why we write this version field? Um, and I can actually show you how this increases. So if I have a fixed ID and I update that document, because the put is the same, a write or an update. Um, so here you can see that the version keeps increasing. Where could that be useful? Yeah? Yeah, no, the translog should be in the background. That's not the case. Um, yes. No, not when merging by seconds. Uh, segments. So one thing that Elastic, yeah, yes, please. 
Yes, exactly. So the Elasticsearch, like most NoSQL data stores, because I'm not sure if Elasticsearch is really the core system in that, um, don't have multi document transactions or no transactions at all. So how do you avoid concurrent writes that overwrite each other? So the relational world is kind of pessimistic in that regard, and that has pessimistic uh, concurrency control where it locks the document when it writes it. So you read it, so, or you have like, you start the transaction, you read it, you write it back, you release the transaction, and only then can somebody else um, update the document. The NoSQL world is more optimistic, let's say, and we call it optimistic concurrency control. Basically, you read a document, so I read this document, and it has version four. And then when I write it back, I can specify in my write operation, only overwrite this document if it's still at version four. If something else has overwritten this document and we're at version five, six, seven, whatever, reject the write, send it back to the client, and the client needs to figure out what is the right way to reconcile this. Because the assumption is the vast majority of write operations will not run into that situation, so why have that expensive transaction and locking? Um, we'll just optimistically try to write. If it fails, we can still reconcile on the client and figure out what is the right way to go on. Um, so this is why we have that version and why it's there. Um, yes, please. So, sorry, this is... So the, the sequence number and the primary term, um, these were added in 7.0 and they added a lot for the resiliency of Elasticsearch. Um, so the sequence number is basically the counter of write operations within that chart. And the primary term is if you have a failover of master nodes, the pri that primary term would increase. So basically, it gives you a total order of operations within that chart. Um, so you don't have any concurrency bugs around that. Those were added in 7.0 and have since been around for that. I, I mean, it's just a counter. Um, normally, for this is within this document with the ID. This is for all the documents within that chart. Um, but it's basically a counter. And before somebody um, asks what if this rolls over, I think you also need to write, I don't know how many billion documents. It, it doesn't happen. Um, this is, I think, a long. Um, OK. Um, something that um, I've shortly mentioned was that refresh. And I've actually uh, put together a short demo to show that refresh. So um, I'm creating a new index called databases one shard, it's fine, with a refresh interval of 30 seconds. So by default, it would be one second. Here I'm saying, batch up all the write operations into that segment for 30 seconds, and only then create a new segment. Why would I want to do that? I need to create fewer segments, so it's cheaper. I need to do fewer merges, because I have fewer and larger ones, so it's again cheaper and more resource in intensive. So if you want to create, uh, increase the write throughput, a higher refresh rate would help you with that. The downside is, um, obviously, it takes up to 30 seconds to see a document in a multi-document operation. Um, so I'm setting this 30 seconds. Um, I write the current version of Elasticsearch into that. And then a get is a single document operation. That always happens immediately. Um, if I do a search, um, this might now take up to 30 seconds um, until I find this. Um, and I can. Keep doing this for a while, and at some point it will appear. Um, you have to be patient because it might indeed take 30 seconds. Um, well, it takes a while. Now, and now it is here. Um, I can now do a put to update this document. So let's say we release 8.3, which will come out in the coming weeks or month. Um, if I do a get, will I get that document back immediately? Yes. Um, if I do a search, Without the body, what will I get the document back immediately? Yes, it will be the old version because it probably hasn't been updated yet. Um, and again, I need to create, I need to run this a couple of times, and now it has been updated. Um, you can call a so-called refresh explicitly to create the segment, but it's kind of expensive, so don't do that. What you could do instead in your request is you can say refresh wait for. So this will block the write operation until the refresh has happened so your application actually knows when to continue and when it can read that value back in a multi-document operation. The one place where you mostly stumble over this artifact 
is in unit tests or integration tests, because there you expect to write the document and read it back immediately, whereas in most other scenarios for full text search, um, and with a refresh interval of one second, you don't really recognize or notice it. Um, there's also another optimization that we have built into Elasticsearch since 7.0 that if you do not do a search operation for 30 seconds, we will stop creating those small segments and only create them as needed. Once you do another search operation, we will then immediately create the segment and make it searchable. But it's basically to increase the right throughput by not creating the small segments unnecessarily um, and still giving you quick access when searching. Just the first search operation will have to wait for a one second refresh until that happens. But that is another Im uh, improvement uh, built in under the hood. Um, so refresh is one of the things that you can play around with to ha increase your uh, write throughput. The other big setting that you need to set is the heap. And we've had various settings for that. Um, by default, I think we had four gigs of heap by default. By the way, what, what if you have an instance, um, how much memory should you give to the heap and uh, how much should you leave for the rest of the system? Yes? Half? Yeah, yes, that is. That is almost, or that was the recommendation for a, for a very long time. Um, we have changed it now. Um, so it got a bit, so we have done a lot of improvements. By now, the heap um, sizes can be smaller. Um, why do you even leave space? Because there is file system level caching. Um, it's called memory mapping in the background. So it's basically writing the, the file to disk. And then when you load it, it's being loaded into memory. It's memory mapped. And you can quickly access it. And you can leave half or less by now for the heap or for the heap and the rest for caching um, to keep your system running. Um, we have also changed the defaults. But Elasticsearch, by default, will now take half of the memory of your instance and assumes it's the only service running on your server. That is another thing that sometimes tricks people because they have five things running on a server and don't configure the heap explicitly. And then Elasticsearch is very greedy and just say takes half because it assumes that's you want to give the entire node to Elasticsearch. That's the default assumption. If you do that, you need to reconfigure your heap, or it generally makes sense to configure your heap explicitly because otherwise Elasticsearch will be greedy and take everything it can or thinks is the right amount um, to make that faster in the long run. Um, one other thing that is important for, especially if you have something like time series data, so any logs, metrics, traces, or anything that ages out, um, is previously all the data was the same, which was kind of stupid because if the data has a life cycle, you often have like the so-called hot data, which is like you write it today and you do most of your search operations today. And then the data from yesterday to a week ago is like warm, so you don't write to it anymore or maybe only very little. You do fewer searches, and then you have the cold tier, which is, I always call it the compliance tier, when you need to keep the data around or the logs around for a year, because somebody might need something, but most of the times nobody does. And why would you keep all of them on the same hardware profile? It's very wasteful. Um, so what, what we generally would have is um, we have hot nodes. Um, warm, and then um, cold, or or now we also have a frozen tier, but I'll ignore that for now. Um, and what you do is, today's write operations come into this one. Um, and this, has, this is a very beefy node um, where you keep relatively little data on it because it has all the write operations and most of the search operations. Once it ages out, it moves the data to a warm node where it keeps it around for mostly search operations. And then this is like the compliance layer. All of this um, we have built into the cluster now, and we call it ILM which stands for Index Lifecycle Management. Um, and it's basically built in, or it's not basically, it is built into the Elasticsearch cluster. And, and you can configure a policy, um, how or when to move the data to the different stages, um, so you can use more optimized hardware profiles. If you have any logs, metrics, or traces, we would highly recommend to do that. You can also configure when it should roll over from one index to another index, so you have evenly sized charts. Previously, people were often using daily indices. Um, and then on Saturday and Sunday, you probably had very few logs and very tiny shards. And on the weekdays, you had a lot, um, which was not great. So you want to have those evenly sized. Um, so that, that is kind of like the, the, how I, we would recommend to structure anything that you have for a time series. 
Um, if you want to run any benchmarks, um, so we publish a lot of benchmark scenarios. Um, and like I've said before, our favorite statement is always, it depends, uh, because there are so many different scenarios based on um, read-write ratios, how large are documents, how many updates do you have, what is the general use case, what is your hardware profile. Um, and this is like, this will scroll down here almost forever, and where we, where we benchmark everything every night, um, we try to avoid, it's the, called the, the slow boiling frog problem. Anybody from France here, so you know where that's coming from? You know, when you, when you take the frog and you throw it in the boiling water, it jumps out immediately. But if you put it in the cold water and slowly turn it up, it sits there and thinks everything is fine until it's boiled. And you want to avoid that with your own systems because it gets, today this commit makes something a little worse and that other commit makes it even worse. So your, your performance suffers over time. Um, so that's why we have these nightly benchmarks on dedicated hardware. Um, so we figure out when we are being boiled by our own slowness um, to counteract that. And actually the tool to do that is called Rally, which we call a, a macro benchmarking uh, tool for Elasticsearch. It has so-called tracks um, where you can benchmark. If you have any scenarios where you are very concerned about the performance of your system, we would generally recommend to build the scenario in Rally and then run those benchmarks to figure out for your data, for your hardware, for your reads and writes, uh, what makes sense and what gives you enough performance. Okay, I think I've covered most of the things. Any questions? Yes, please. It, it really actually, okay. Okay. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Unfortunately, yes, I don't have frogs. Um, any other comments? And before you all run off, I always try to take a picture with you so I can prove to my colleagues that I've been working today. Um, can you wave? Thank you very much. Um, final questions? Otherwise, I'm around for the rest of the day. There are stickers when you go out. Um, please take the stickers so I don't have to take them. Anybody wants a final ball? Oops, sorry. Um, thanks so much. Enjoy the rest of the day.